Someone once said that power is a sacred trust, and with it, men can do much good or much harm. Therefore, let him who deserves it have it. Now, every person is given a measure of power, the ability to make decisions and influence people around them. Now, the scope of that power and influence begins quite small, usually as we experience in the early days in the sandbox, and then maybe a little later on the playground. But as we get older, that scope of power and influence widens. Our circle of influence gets larger, such that as we move into adulthood, our power and influence can grow beyond our family and may extend into our workplace, our community, and our church. Now, for some, this sacred trust of power and influence comes with a position and a title. But for most of us, it is informal, relational, and situational. At other times, we give power and authority to people by voting them in, by signing a contract, or by asking them to take the lead in something. And because we are relational beings made in the image of God, as we grow to love and trust the people around us, we grant them the ability to influence us. We grant that ability to family and our spouse, friends, small group members, and others. But again, power is a sacred trust And with it, men can do much good or much harm. Therefore, we must be cautious to give it only to deserving people. And at the same time, we must seek to be deserving of the measure of power and influence that has been granted to us. Now, as we continue on in our Elijah series this morning, we've come to the account of a young man named Jehoram who was given tremendous power, though he was not deserving of it. And he misuses that power, resulting in much harm, not only to his family and to the people he leads, but even to himself. So this morning, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 21, and we're going to work our way through this chapter together and see what the Lord would want to teach us together. Now, as you're turning there, let me tell you a couple of things. First, today's message in our Elijah series is going to be different from all of the other messages in two simple but very important ways. First of all, all of the other sermons have been anchored in 1st and 2nd Kings, that those two Old Testament books of 1st and 2nd Kings. Today's message is found in 2nd Chronicles. Now, the books of Kings and Chronicles were written by two different authors. Jewish tradition tells us that Jeremiah wrote the book of Kings and that Ezra uh, assembled the two books of Chronicles. I make this point because Ezra's style in Chronicles and some of his word choice is a bit different than what we've been used to in Jeremiah. And so it will require a little bit of clarification at one point later in the sermon just to prevent confusion. The second thing I wanted to let you know is that Elijah's prophetic ministry has focused almost exclusively on the house of Ahab in the northern kingdom of Israel. So every message this far has been focused on Elijah's confrontations and his corrections to King Ahab and King Ahab's family. But in today's passage, the Lord leads Elijah to confront the king of Judah in the southern kingdom. It's a different royal family. But we will soon discover that the two royal families are actually connected. So with those two comments, hoping to whet your appetite a little, let's dive in and see what this chapter uh, has for us today. Chapter 21 begins by telling us about Jehoram's family. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 4. Jehoram's family. It says, Then Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David. 
and Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariahu, Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was his firstborn son. When Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all of his brothers to the sword, along with some of the princes of Israel." The passage opens with the death of a man named Jehoshaphat, and his son Jehoram becomes king. Let me take just a moment and describe kind of the larger historical context for you, just so that this this passage makes sense in light of the other sermons in Elijah. For 120 years, Israel had lived as a united kingdom under the reign of three kings. You'll recognize their names, Saul, David, and Solomon. Each of those three men had reigned for about 40 years. But when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took the throne, he immediately faced a critical leadership decision. And when he made the wrong choice... A civil war broke out, and it left the nation of Israel divided. Two tribes, remember there were 12 tribes in the the nation of Israel, two tribes remained loyal to the house of David, Judah and Benjamin. And those two tribes became known as the southern kingdom, called Judah. The remaining 10 tribes formed the northern kingdom and kept the name Israel. Now, about 60 years has passed since that civil war. And during that time, the northern kingdom of Israel had seven kings. And every one of them was wicked. Every one of them. And the seventh king was King Ahab, who we have heard his story every week, right? In the sermon series on Elijah. Uh, Elijah has repeatedly rebuked and challenged Uh, Ahab and his family. Now, during this same 60-year window, the southern kingdom of Judah has had four kings, and Jehoshaphat was number four. That's where he fits in the lineup. He and his father, Asa, were good kings. They walked in obedience to the Lord. They did what the Lord required of them. And Jehoshaphat had reigned for about 25 years. But now, Verse 1 tells us that he has passed away. A good king has passed away. And his son Jehoram has taken the throne. Now, most Bible historians believe that his son co-reigned with him in kind of a dual, kind of a partnership with his dad for about five years. But now that his father has died, Jehoram rules the country on his own. This sacred trust of power now rests in his hands alone. Now verse 2 tells us Jehoram had six brothers and half-brothers, most likely from the various wives of King Jehoshaphat. And notice in verse 2 that Jehoshaphat is called the king of Israel rather than being called the king of Judah. Now this might be a little bit confusing because we're talking now about the southern kingdom. But here's what's going on. Ezra, the author of Chronicles, chose this particular phrase, king of Israel, because he regarded the kingdom of Judah to be the faithful remnant before the Lord, the true Israel of God. And that belief influenced him to use the phrase king of Israel here, king of the true Israel, rather than king of Judah. And to to avoid confusion in my own mind, I simply wrote the word Judah above the word Israel in the text, just to serve as a reminder for me. And just so you know, the author will do that again in verse 4, when he he says that uh, Jehoram killed the princes of Israel. That means the princes of Judah. Judah. 
Now, Jehoshaphat was generous with his sons before they died. Verse 3 says he gave them gifts of gold and silver and valuable possessions, even establishing them in fortified cities around the kingdom. This was a common practice in some of the ancient Near East countries. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, had done the same thing for his sons. Not only was it generous, but it was also politically smart because it allowed Jehoshaphat to spread the presence of his royal family around the kingdom, helping his firstborn son Jehoram transition more smoothly into the role as king. Jehoshaphat is remembered as one of the few good kings in the history of Israel, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord certainly blessed him during his reign as king. In that culture, back in that day, having numerous sons and material wealth and fortified cities in your possession, all of that was seen as a sign, an outward sign of God's blessing. But being a man of sincere faith does not mean that Jehoshaphat always made good leadership decisions. He was periodically rebuked because of political and commercial alliances that he formed, some with King Ahab and others with some foreign countries. And he was rebuked for those. And some would suggest that his decision to place Jehoram on the throne instead of a different son, some would say that was a really unwise thing to do. But he did it. He did it, and now Jehoshaphat has passed away. The royal scepter, that sacred trust of power and influence, those are now in Jehoram's grasp. And sadly, he began to misuse and abuse that sacred trust almost immediately. Verse 4 tells us that once Jehoram had established himself, once he'd gotten settled into the rhythm and routines of the palace, then he killed all of his brothers, putting them to the sword, along with some of the princes of Israel. And again, read that phrase as princes of Judah. And as awful as that is to hear, This also was fairly common in the ancient Near East. Kings often had multiple wives and concubines, and there were numerous sons. And this meant that there would be many sons claiming to be the rightful heir to the throne when the king died. And even if a son was named king, his brothers and half-brothers could still rise up and try to overthrow him. Now, in Old Testament Israel, this was less common, though it still happened from time to time. It was more common for a royal family to be executed when a new family altogether took the throne in order to prevent uprisings from the predecessor's descendants. But this was different. For one son to take the throne and then kill his own brothers, this was far less common and certainly not acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. You know, in the eyes of righteous men, brothers are a blessing from the Lord. But in the eyes of the unrighteous and insecure and power-hungry, brothers begin to look like rivals. wonder if Jehoram sensed a rivalry brewing under the surface. I wonder if he had some insecurity that began to stir up fear in his mind. Each of his brothers had received a fortified city from their father, and maybe Jehoram was scared of what might happen if they became a united force against him. So instead of trusting the Lord to establish his reign, instead of calling his brothers together to pray and seek God's blessing, Instead, he chose the way of the Canaanites and he killed his brothers so that they could pose no threat to him. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk warned against using bloodshed to establish one's own security. But this is exactly what Jehoram had done. You know, what we read in these first four verses should remind us to examine our own hearts. 
we need to examine our own hearts. We should agree with the psalmist when he prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked ideas lurking in the shadows of my heart and mind, bring them into the light and lead me in the way of righteousness. We should ask ourselves, what dark thoughts or ideas have bubbled to the surface in my own heart and mind this past week? Who have I wrongly treated as an enemy that I should have treated as a brother? This kind of quiet reflection is important, friends, because here's the truth. Here's the truth. The sin in Jehoram's heart lingers in our hearts too. The sin in in Jehoram's heart lingers in our heart. But here's the deal. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can recognize it and own it and acknowledge it. We can bring it out of the shadows and into the light of Christ's love. And then we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he does his work and as he seeks to replace those sinful ideas with the goodness and gentleness and kindness of Christ so that we can treat people around us as they deserve, not according to our fears. We would be wise to examine our own hearts regularly. I think that's what those first four verses remind us. But now the chapter continues, and it begins to tell us a little about Jehoram's reign. So look at verses 5 through 7 with me. It says, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. That is not a compliment. He walked as the house of Ahab had done. For he married, he married the daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. And he promised, he had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. Let's pause and look a little bit at these verses. So Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned for eight years. And here we discover that the king of Judah was actually related to the royal family in Israel by marriage. He had married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And here's what happened. Jehoram's father, Jehoshaphat, He yearned, he had this deep desire to see Israel and Judah united again as one country, just as it had been in the days of David and Solomon. And so he unwisely formed alliances with King Ahab. One of those alliances was the marriage of his son Jehoram to Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. And Jehoshaphat hoped that the marriage would eventually lead to the reunification of Judah and Israel. He hoped that his son and daughter-in-law would bring the people back together again. But they did not. Oh, no, they did not. Instead, this alliance, this marriage, opened the door for the worship of Baal to make its way into the southern kingdom of Judah. Prior to this, there was kind of this a figurative wall of separation that existed between Israel to the north and Judah to the south. The northern kingdom had completely turned their backs on the Lord and rejected him altogether. But in Judah, in the southern kingdom, there were still these glimpses of reverence for God. Eight of her kings walked with the Lord and did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Jehoshaphat was one of those eight. But this alliance by marriage served only to diminish any remaining flames of reverence for God. And this young king in Judah was undoubtedly influenced by his in-laws, which helps us understand why he made the choices that he made. The text says, Jehoram walked in the ways of the king of Israel. And like Ahab, he displeased the Lord and weakened the nation. But God remained faithful. God remained faithful. 
even as he does today. And even though Jehoram and Athaliah and her family were wretchedly corrupt, God remained faithful to the covenant he made with King David. See, back in 2 Samuel 7, King David was preparing to build a temple for the Lord as a way to honor him. And during that time, the Lord sent a prophet named Nathan to David. And Nathan said, David, I have something to tell you. Yahweh, the God of Israel, has promised to build a house for you, a ruling dynasty for you, David. He's going to make your name great, and he will establish your throne forever. And in 1 Kings 11, God made this promise. He said, my servant David will always have a lamp before me. Meaning that as long as Judah remained faithful to the Lord, David would always have a descendant on the throne. And so in our passage, being faithful to that promise, verse verse 7 says, God was not willing to destroy Jehoram or the house of David because uh, because of his covenant. He was not willing to execute immediate judgment on Jehoram. God was patient and wayward with sinful people giving them time to repent, not desiring that any of them should perish, not even Jehoram. And so instead of destroying Jehoram immediately, God instead brought several political and military defeats, political setbacks to Judah, trying to get Jehoram's attention. Look at verses 8 through 10. It says, In the time of Jehoram, Edom rebelled against Judah and set up its own king. So Jehoram went there with his officers and all his chariots, and the Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he rose up and broke through the night. And to this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. Libna revolted at the same time because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his fathers. So because of Jehoram's disobedience, Judah now, as part of God's program, Judah's beginning to lose political influence. And Edom rebelled and set up its own king. Edom had been, Edom is located southeast of Judah and had been subject to Judah for 150 years, ever since the reign of King David. And Jehoram responded by uh, with bringing his military down to Edom to try and uh, squash the rebellion. But the Edomites surrounded him. They created kind of a stranglehold around surrounding him. And he barely managed to escape with his life. And he was unable to subdue Edom again. And then Libna revolted at the same time. Now, Libna is a fortress city, and it protects Jerusalem, and it's located on the western side of Judah. And when Libna revolted, it left the capital city vulnerable to attack. And Ezra, the writer, makes the reason for this revolt perfectly clear. He says, when the king followed the Lord, Libna followed the king. But when the king turned away from the Lord, Libna turned away from the king. So God uses these political and military setbacks to try and get Jehoram's attention. And then one final thing we're told about Jehoram's reign in verse 11. It says, He had also built high places on the hills of Judah and had caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves and had led Judah astray. Jehoram would go down in Judah's history as the first king who actually constructed high places. High places were these altar sites where they made sacrifices to false gods, to idols. This was a clear sign of Jehoram's unfaithfulness. And he led the people to join him in the idolatry, causing them to prostitute themselves. These were uh, days of deep, dark, spiritual... uh, It was a quagmire. It was a mess in Judah. And the evil influence of Jezebel... Athaliah and the false prophets of Baal were infiltrating the land. I think these six verses remind us that sometimes God uses circumstances to try to get our attention. 
Sometimes God can use circumstances when he needs to get our attention. You know, the Lord used these military defeats and these political setbacks to try to get Jehoram uh, to recognize God. But Jehoram wouldn't do it. Now, let me be very quick to clarify something. I do not mean to say that every hard and difficult circumstance is the Lord trying to get your attention because you've done something wrong. I don't believe that. I'm not trying to say that at all. I'm simply trying to recognize from these verses that sometimes, sometimes God uses circumstances to try to get our attention. And the question that I was led to ask myself this week as I studied and prepared for this was this question. Lord, is there anything in my life that you have been trying to get my attention about? Is there anything in my life that you've been trying to get me to see? Now, the truth is, we're often too busy or too distracted or too stubborn to hear his still small voice. And so sometimes he will use circumstances to get our attention. And I don't know about you, but I don't want the Lord to have to hit me upside the head to get my attention. I just don't. And it pleases the Lord. Friends, hear me say this. It pleases the Lord when we keep ourselves humble and teachable and quiet before him. When we ask him, is there anything in my marriage or in my parenting or in my finances or at my job? Is there anything in my walk with you, Lord, that you need to draw my attention to today? Oh, how that pleases him when we surrender and quiet ourselves and ask those kinds of questions. Just imagine how much joy it would bring to him if each one of us would come before him regularly and surrender ourselves and quiet ourselves in his presence, just giving him an opportunity to show us whatever it is we may have been missing. I think it would be a delight to his heart. Now, the chapter continues telling us about Jehoram's warning. So we learned about his family, then his reign. Now there's a warning, Jehoram's warning. Verse 12 says that Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet. Up until this time, Elijah's prophetic ministry has been focused entirely on the northern kingdom of Israel and almost exclusively on King Ahab and his family. But now, but now... The Lord has turned Elijah's attention to the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And again, most likely that has to do with Jehoram's relationship with the house of Ahab through marriage. But it also has to do with Jehoram now promoting the worship of Baal, just as the house of Ahab had done in Israel. And so the Lord called upon Elijah yet again. And this time Elijah sent a letter to the king of Judah. And he articulated three charges against him. Look at verse 12. It says, Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet, which said, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. You have not walked in the ways of your father Jehoshaphat or of Asa, king of Judah. Pause there for a sec. With this opening line, Elijah uses three names to grab Jehoram's attention. He uses the names of David, Jehoshaphat, and Asa. He's trying to remind Jehoram that he and his descendants carry a family name. They have a responsibility of faithfulness, a responsibility to the nation, a responsibility to the covenant God had made. God's covenant with the nation was directly tied to this family's lineage. And so being a descendant of the house of David carried tremendous privilege, but also great responsibility. David was the father of the dynasty, a man after God's own heart. Asa was Jehoram's grandfather, and he had purged the land of great evil. And then Jehoshaphat, Jehoram's father, took great pride in the ways of the Lord, and he taught the law of the Lord to the people. Now Jehoram is from that line of David. And with that comes great responsibility. 
And just as a side note to all of us, friends, those of us who identify as followers of Jesus, we bear his name before a watching world. And we too have tremendous responsibility to live in accordance with the law of the Lord, to do what is right in the sight of the Lord because we bear his name. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 16? He says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and then glorify your Father in heaven. We have a responsibility if we name the name of Christ. But Jehoram's heart rejected all of this. He rejected the godly role models and chose to follow his father-in-law, Ahab. The second and third charge against Jehoram is found in verse 13, which says, But you have walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and you have led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, just as the house of Ahab did. And you have also murdered your own brothers, members of your father's house, men who were better than you. And that last phrase, men who were better than you, seems to suggest men who had more wisdom and virtue, men who were living up to the training of their father, which Jehoram had turned his back on. They were men who would have opposed the worship of Baal and shut down that uh, temptation in a moment. In fact, one scholar suggested that Jehoram may have killed his brothers simply so they could not oppose his promotion of Baal. That's how closely he was tied to the house of Ahab. Now, Elijah's letter concludes, So now you will reap what you have sown. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, So now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. You yourself will be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out. That's pleasant, isn't it? (laughs) Elijah warned Jehoram that because of what he had done, the Lord was about to bring judgment on the king, striking a heavy blow to the people and his sons and his wives and his possessions and even to the king himself the king would suffer this painful bowel disease that would claim his life. Interestingly, when Elijah spoke his final words of judgment to King Ahab, we we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, Ahab, if you remember, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted in remorse. And the Lord graciously delayed the judgment. He didn't cancel it, he just delayed it. But Jehoram did nothing of the kind. He simply ignored Elijah's warning. And the Lord had prompted the words of Elijah's letter so that when these events came to pass, they would certainly, and they would certainly come to pass. But when they did, they would be recognized for what they were, a a fulfillment of the prophet's words and a punishment directly from the hand of the Lord. Not bad luck or, you know, chance events. This was from the hand of the Lord. Friends, reading these four verses about Elijah's letter should remind you and me that the consequence for our sin affects people around us. The consequence of our sin affects people around us, just like it did Jehoram. Jehoram's sin included his family, and then the consequence did too. Truth is, we never sin unto ourselves. Our sinful choices and the painful results that spill over uh, that the painful results that occur spill over onto the people around us. And it should cause us to think twice. So let me offer this suggestion to you. Some of you may find this helpful. When you are tempted to do something or say something that you know is wrong, you know it's wrong, but you're tempted to do it anyway, pause for just a moment And think about the people closest to you. Bring their faces to your mind. Think about those that you love. Because the consequence of your decision may spill over onto them. 
And we can let their faces be a powerful incentive to move us in the direction of righteousness if we will pause long enough to bring their face to mind. The final section of this chapter reveals Jehoram's demise. Jehoram's demise. Look at verse 16. It says, The Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. Remember, Edom was to the southeast, and they had rebelled. And Libna was to the west, and they had revolted. So Judah had military action on two fronts. And the Philistines, the Lord stirred up their hostility, and the Philistines saw their opportunity. They'd been paying tribute to Jehoshaphat for years, and they were terrified of him. But now Jehoshaphat was dead. And, they stu- and the Lord had stirred up their hostility against Jehoram, and they attacked. The Philistines attacked, and the Arabs also attacked from the south. And suddenly, Jehoram had trouble on three sides. This was part of the, d- the downfall for him. Verse 17, they attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace, together with his sons and wives. Not a son was left to him, except Ahaziah the youngest. So they attacked Judah, but here's the interesting point. They focused their attack only on the palace, only on the king's house. They carried off the king's belongings, his sons and his wives, and all of them were killed, except for the youngest son, just one, Ahaziah, This was the heavy blow that Elijah had foretold in his letter. This was the heavy blow. You know, in the outworking of God's justice, Jehoram's decision to kill his brothers without cause set in motion a series of events that would end up killing all but one of his own sons. In fact, had Jehoram not been a descendant of King David, even the youngest son would have died. That youngest one was spared, remember, because God was faithful to the promise to David. And finally, verses 18 to 20, after all of this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. In the course of time, at the end of the second year, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great pain. People made no fire, in his honor, as they had for his fathers. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. The text closes with the disease and death of the king. You know, normally when a king died, a fire was made for the burning of spices. This was an elaborate display and it was always intended to show honor and respect and to provide an opportunity for mourning. But no customary funeral fire was lit to honor Jehoram. He passed away to no one's regret. This was a tragic end for a descendant of King David. And the text says that while he was buried in Jerusalem, he was not considered worthy to be buried in the tombs of the kings. He had governed so poorly. Let me close today with one final reminder for us. Because reading these final verses should remind us that an unrepentant heart conformed to this world will eventually face God's judgment. An unrepentant heart conformed to this world will eventually face God's judgment. The Bible repeatedly tells us it is God's desire that all should come to repentance, that none should perish. The Bible tells us he take, that God takes no pleasure in the judgment and death of anyone. The path of repentance leads us to God's mercy and grace and forgiveness, and it's available to all of us because of Jesus' death on the cross. But if people ignore the warnings, if we ignore the warnings, just as Jehoram ignored the warning of Elijah's letter, if they ignore it, then they turn away from that opportunity and the path of righteousness, and they choose for themselves the path that leads to judgment 
and death. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never heard about a path of righteousness, if you've never heard that God offers mercy and grace and forgiveness to those who would turn to him, I would love to visit with you briefly after the service. Maybe we could set up a time to get together this week and talk some more. I'd love to tell you more about that. But we are out of time this morning, and so I'm going uh, to close our service uh, with a final prayer today. Heavenly Father, your word is a gift and a blessing. Scripture says it is a lamp to guide our feet and a light to guide our life. We look to it every day for wisdom and guidance. For where else would we turn for the words of life? Your word is right and true. It's more desirable than gold, yea, than much fine gold, the psalmist said. May our hearts and our minds respond to it as if it were sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Lord, we thank you for recording the account of Jehoram and Elijah's letter to him. As we think about uh, his family and his reign and his warning and his eventual demise, our own hearts are challenged because your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Things that we read in the text stir up things that we need to be truths that we need to be reminded of. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring your word alive in each of us this week. Remind us of what we have heard this morning. May our hearts not be hard and resistant like Jehoram's, but may our heart be humble and surrendered and quiet and teachable. And may we respond to what we have heard. May our ears be open to the whispers of your spirit as he continues to complete in us the good work that he has started. And may our lives increasingly, increasingly reflect the likeness of Jesus to the praise and glory of you, our heavenly father. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. God bless you as you go. And by his grace, we'll see you again next week. Mm.